Welcome to Higher Change, Psychology for a Whole Life. We're on Chapter 21, Following Your Gut. We're going to talk about emotional awareness in this lesson. The main point of this lesson is that while it once was thought that emotions were an obstacle to rational thinking, we now know that emotion and cognitive thinking are inseparable. Rather than seeing emotions as something to ignore or avoid, we see emotions as something to pay attention to as an indicator needs. So in this lesson, you'll differentiate the dualistic versus non-dualistic views of emotions or the low view or the high view of emotion and rationality. You'll describe main, the main theories of emotions. And lastly, you'll describe how emotions indicate our relational needs. So first, let's talk about the basic, basics of emotion. Emotions can be defined as the feeling aspect of consciousness. Feelings are the result of appraisals of environmental changes. So we're all trying to survive and adapt to a changing world. And emo emotions are results of how we appraise the changes in our environment. There's three main components of emotion. And we use the ABC model that applies also to theories of motivation as well. Uh, the ABCs stand for a, or A stands for affect or arousal. This is the physiological side. So we have a physiological arousal that's also known as affect and emotions. Uh, and then there's the behavioral response. And these typically involve re reactions or interactions with other people. And that's why it's, the, it's grouped together with the social domain. And then lastly, the C stands for cognitive, the cognitive side. So this refers to our thinking processes that go along with emotions. So for example, just to you know think about a specific example, if you get an if you get angry, your body has a physiological response when you're angry. So your heart may race, you may uh, have clenched fist, and your face might feel flushed and that sort of thing. And you interpret the affect as anger. And that's the affect is a physiological response. Then the behavior would be how you express your feelings or you, you lash out or, or express your hurt. Then the cognitive side is the thinking that goes along with it. Maybe you feel like there's an injustice that took place or maybe you just want somebody to listen to you. So emotions are characterized these, by these three components summarized by the ABC model. So A, a is a certain phys physical arousal. Then there is a certain social behavior, B, that, re that reveals the emotion to the outside world. And then C for cognitive. And this can also refer to the inner awareness of our feelings or the subjective experience, how we label it. So let's talk about the biology of emotion. There are different, different emotions have been found to be associated with different physiological re reactions, such as sympathetic nervous system activity. So remember, what is the sympathetic nervous system? That's not necessarily sympathy in a positive sense. It means the activation of uh, you know, your body. So like the fight or flight response. You know, this is when your heart increases, the heart rate increases and your breathing gets faster and that sort of thing. Parasympathetic is when your body slows down. So the autonomic system is involved with the emotions. When you're when you get angry your heart is more likely your heart rate is more likely to increase as you think about it and you you know you're uh, if you're afraid for example you might breathe faster because it's preparing you to preparing your body for the fight or flight response so the amygdala plays a role in the regulation of emotions in humans as well as other animals particularly fear so the amygdala is the fear center in early childhood, the amygdala begins making emotional memories even before cognitive memory matures. So the emotional memory begins before cognitive memory. And that's partly because that's one of the reasons why we, we may not remember some of the things early on because it's more of an emotional experience. Uh, whereas we cannot develop the cognitive memory until we start being able to understand the world around us. And we're able to symbolically represent our world in our head. Uh, and so, you know, when children start to speak and use words, that's when they are able to remember things better. The amygdala subconsciously processes all incoming stimuli, even before the neocortex processes it. So that's pretty fascinating. We usually think emotions come from a cognitive, uh, from the cognitive side, but the amygdala is processing things subconsciously even before 
we're able to process it at a higher level. So emotional reactions may be formed based on visual information even before a person is conscious of it. So for example, some people have described uh, feeling sad all of a sudden and then they're not really sure why. But when they think about the stimulus or the stimuli that have been going on around them, they may be triggered by a, a song that's playing in the background and they may not even be consciously aware of what's going on but just the music playing in the background can make someone feel sad. So the behaviors of emotions include facial expressions, body movements, and other actions. Research has supported the idea that at least seven basic universal facial expressions are recognized and produced in cultures around the world. So no matter what language you speak, you can recognize what generally what people are feeling, even if they don't speak the same language. So the cast of characters for the Disney movie Inside Out reflects these basic kinds of emotions. You may remember some of the uh, characters in the movie Inside Out. They had anger, sadness, fear, and joy. I believe that's uh, there may be another one I'm forgetting. So understanding and interpreting subjective feelings involves labeling, which can be shaped by one's language and culture. So some, la some cultures have more words for some emotions like love whereas in other cultures, they don't. Men generally have greater difficulty interpreting their feelings than women. So women tend to be much more uh, in tune with their emotions and have a greater grasp of vocabulary related to their emotions. So let's talk about the dualistic or non-dualistic views of emotion. Historically, emotions have been viewed as irrational or opposed to reason. This is the high reason view meaning that reason is more uh, intellectual. This view is promoted by Plato, Rene Descartes, and Immanuel Kant, who believed that emotions hindered rational thinking. But you know, the interesting thing is even sociopaths can be appear rational and yet unemotional. So, you know, cold, you know, people who, who are serial killers can uh, kill people in cold blood and not have any emotions. So that kind of goes against the idea that emotions are necessarily the bad thing. You know, people who, in fact, maybe you need to be more in tune with emotions sometimes. So Antonio Damasio argues in Descartes' error that Rene Descartes' error was a dualistic separation of mind and body, rationality and emotion. So as you recall from our previous lessons, dualism has been prevalent in our thinking about human psychology for thousands of years. But this has been problematic. This idea that the mind and body are separate has led to this idea that rationality and emotion are distinct or that they're separate. The reality is rationality and emotions go together. They're both intricately connected. So the modern view is that the mind and body are one. Therefore, emotions serve as a guide to understanding ourselves. Our physiological arousal, the our gut feelings, can be a guide to understanding our rational thinking. So let's talk about some of the modern theories of emotion. First of all, several theories have been developed to explain the processes uh, that humans use to label our emotions. One of the first view is the common sense view. This is not really a scientific view as much as this is just the, the general view that most people think of to explain emotions. And this is that a stimulus causes a particular emotion to occur which then leads to the behavioral and physiological response. Now, I like the movie Inside Out, but the movie Inside Out really kind of perpetuates this common sense view. If you think about it, they have some of the uh, Riley, the character Riley in the movie, has these uh, feelings inside her head, like sadness, anger, that sort of thing. And so these are the people, these cast of characters, these feelings, are what creates their response. And so if you think about it this way, first of all, you have a stimulus, so like a bear coming at you. This presents a threat. So then your body, according to this, according to this common sense theory, your, the first response in your body is you have a conscious emotion such as fear. And that fear then produces a physiological arousal in the autonomic nervous system. So if you think about in the, in the movie Inside Out, um, then the these characters, emotions would control Riley's response. 
that's a common sense theory, but it's not exactly how most modern scientists and psychologists view emotion. So the common sense view comes from the dualistic idea that emotions are an abstract concept waiting in the mind to be triggered, like in the movie Inside Out. So the eminent psychologists William James and physiologist Carl Lang developed the James Lang theory of emotion, which proposes that an environmental stimulus leads to a particular physiological response, such as an increased heart rate or breathing. This then leads to the interpretation of the physical response or the subjective experience of emotion and the labeling of an emotion. He believed that without a physiological response, then a response is merely intellectual rather than emotional. So it really requires the physiological response. So if we think about it, this process, it looks like this. Instead of the, uh, now in both the common sense and the James Lang theory, they start with a stimulus, such as a threatening bear coming at you. But in the James Lang theory, the first response is a physiological arousal in the autonomic system. So, um, you know, for example, if you see a bear coming at you, your heart rate's going to increase, your, your breathing's going to increase, and that's going to prepare you to run. And then the second response is having a subjective experience based on the physiological arousal. So then we're able to interpret what our feelings are based on how our body's reacting. So that's the James Lang theory. Now, Sylvan Tompkins has continued in the tradition of, of identifying a process of how feelings arise, but Tompkins believed that those arose more auto automatically. So in his affect theory, Tompkins believed that there were a limited number of biologically hardwired human emotions known as affects. And we talked about this in the behavior, I mean, the biological component of emotions. Affect is the physiological arousal. And these are universal to all humans across cultures. For example, when a baby is born, a baby is born crying because it needs something. And this is a, a practically biologically hardwired or instinctive. Tompkins classified these affects as positive, negative, or resetting affects, which I won't go into. But the basic point is that even babies are born with uh, aff you know, physiological response or affects. And uh, these do not necessarily require high levels of cognitive thinking in order to experience. The facial feedback hypothesis is a theory of emotion that started by Darwin that assumes that facial expressions provide feedback to the brain regarding the emotion being expressed and can then intensify or even cause emotion. So this goes along with the, that idea that the physiological response helps us to understand our own emotions. So this is the facial feedback hypothesis. And Antonio Damasio's somatic marker hypothesis, hypothesis rationality requires emotional input from gut feelings. So this is a little more advanced than the facial feedback hypothesis, which really focuses on the face. A lot of people, a lot of criticisms of that is that you know, sometimes you may not see any emotions on the face, but you can still feel an emotion. So in other words, decisions are made by considering bodily sensations known as somatic markers. And this can include increase in, in skin conductance, which indicates a, s a sympathetic arousal in the autonomic nervous system. And this accompanies contemplating various response options. So somatic markers are basically gut feelings that tell us it helps us to pre-select our responses. So a research study of uh, emotions looked at how people or where people locate their feelings in their body. So this is called a heat map. This is where people, they drew on a human outline where their emotions were at. And so they used different colors and you can see that there was a common theme among the feelings. So for example, um, anger at the top, most, most people located it as a hot feeling in the head. Whereas other feelings like depression tend to be associated with blue. It's a colder color and it seemed to radiate more around the body as well. And it felt dark inside. So obviously this is not exactly like, um, this is more of, 
how people perceive their emotions. This is not anatomic. These are not anatomical drawings. These are more just how people locate their feelings in their body. So the Canon Bard theory suggests that the physical and subjective experience of emotions occur at the same time. So rather than one coming before the other, they both occur simultaneously. A stimulus leads to activation of the thalamus, which then simultaneously activates the sympathetic nervous system and higher cortical areas, which interpret the signal as a particular emotion. So it goes on at the same time. And then the, the cortex uh, helps interpret the signals as a particular emotion, but they both occur simultaneously. So what are some recent thinking of emotions? Well, first, we, we now understand that emotions can be an indicator of our needs. So rather than seeing emotions as something to ignore, we pay attention to our emotions because it tells us about what our needs are. So just as some examples, if you're feeling sad, you might have a need to cry. You may need con consolation or connection with other people. If you feel angry, you might have a need for justice or being heard or listened to. If you feel afraid, your body may be preparing for a fight or flight because you may feel a need to fight for something if you're being attacked or to run away and hide. And if you feel shame, you may have a need to avoid or hide yourself because if you think about it, when people are ashamed, they oftentimes divert their eyes and that's because there's a there's an innate desire or need to, to hide oneself. Joy or happiness may just simply require someone to share that joy or happiness with. Loneliness may indicate a need for a relationship. And, and there is some importance in that emotion because if we didn't feel lonely, we would never have a need for relationships. And we also have an, uh, th the needs associated with jealousy. If you feel jealous, that may be because you need security in your relationship. So these are these are not hard and fast by any means, but it just simply shows that whenever you have an emotion, it may be indicating a need that you are trying to fulfill or that you need to fulfill. And this co connects us with attachment theory. Attachment theory helps us understand our need or drive to become attached to other adults. Whereas affect theory shows us how different emotions develop to motivate us to get those needs met. So most of these, most of the needs that we have tend to be relational in, in nature, or it's simply about getting our biological needs met. In other words, all of these needs are important though. Affect theory helps us to understand how our body gets those needs met through communicating our emotions with others. So if we think about it this way, emotions is Emotions are part of how we communicate our needs. We don't just communicate verbally, we also communicate non-verbally. The first mode of communication is sharing facial affect between infant and mother during mutual facial gazing. The one of the first expressions of need and a baby is crying. It's a form of communication to let a mother or father know that the baby needs food or is cold or that sort of thing. Affects such as interest or shame can either make or break an important attachment bond. Maybe they need, you know, child needs space, or maybe it feels embarrassed, and so it can, uh, you know, affect the relationship. The problem with only looking at physiology, such as affects, uh, is that it is difficult to accurately assess emotions based on facial expressions alone, particularly since cultures may influence how people express, express their emotions differently. So some cultures are more emotionally expressive than others. So you can't always determine how people are feeling just by looking at their faces. And some people are really good at hiding their emotions. Physiology is not enough to explain how emotions arise either. Cognitions do play a role, specifically in terms of appraisals, how we appraise our situations. So let's talk about cognitive theories of emotions. Sachter and Singer proposed that co the cognitive theory, arousal theory of motion, which argues that after a stimulus occurs, our body has a physical reaction and we make a cognitive appraisal or interpretation of the situation. Based on feedback from both these sources, we then come up with a subjective label for the emotion we are ex 
are experiencing. So it really comes down to how we cognitively appraise things. You know, if you if two people are driving down the road and one person's and both people are cut off, you know, it depends a lot on how you uh, appraise the situation. For example, if you appraise the situation as man that guy's being a jerk, you might end up being angry. Whereas if you appraise the situation as man that guy must be in a real hurry, maybe he's got to go to the hospital or something you might not get as angry. You might be more sympathetic or something like that. So how we appraise a situation cognitively will affect our emotional response. Lazarus' cognitive mediational theory is a theory of emotion that suggests that following a stimulus, we must engage in a cognitive appraisal or interpretation of the situation, which then triggers a subjective experience of an emotion followed by a physiological response. So in this theory, it starts with an appraisal which then goes to, I mean, stimulus that, that is, is related to an appraisal or interpretation of the stimulus, which then results in physiological response. So that's it. And I hope you can join us for the next chapter, where, is we, where we talk about facing our feelings, emotional intelligence for dummies.